All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of The Pursuit of Ownership. It is Peyton here, and we have a special new co-host with us today. Uh, We have Stephen Beard with us. Stephen, how are you doing today? I'm great. How are you doing? Dude, I've I've never been better. Um, I'm just super glad to have you on. Uh, He is a D2 at University of Alabama, and uh, you'll probably be hearing a lot more of him here in uh, the coming months. Uh, we'll definitely do an episode to get to know him a little better here soon. Um, but for the time being, uh, we're glad to have you. Um, and to also, yeah, also we have a um, real doc fake name with us today. Uh, we're looking at uh, some practice opportunities. And have you decided what your fake name is going to be? Uh, I am Darth Vader. Darth Vader. I love it. Uh, I, I like I'm it. Not, yeah, I was going to say, I'm not, a, I'm not a huge Star Wars guy. Wait, that's Star Wars, right? Oh man, come on. Yeah, it's I've not, never seen oh, it. Oh, I was like, oh, gosh. I was like, that's about to be really bad. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely respect the name. That's a good one, and I feel like that's going to be easy for us to uh, do a little bit of voice change on because it just oh, that'd be good. It opens it right up. Yeah, um, nice low voice. Exactly, exactly. Uh, great. Well, we were kind of talking before uh, the episode started here, and you have uh, a somewhat interesting uh, set of. I guess, set of acquisitions here uh, that you're yeah. potentially looking at. Um, but before we get into that, I just kind of wanted to uh, get a little bit of background on you. Um, obviously, you're welcome to share or as much or as little as you like. Um, but yeah, just kind of, you know, starting in dental school and moving forward, um, just kind of give us a little background to get the uh, episode started here. Sure. So uh, I graduated last May, which was a crazy year to graduate, of course. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've been listening to shared practices since D, D3, D4 year. Um, I've always wanted to buy a practice, though, um, even for dental school. So this is no surprise to me that I'm looking at a practice right now. Um, yeah, so do you want me to go into the the practices? Whoa, whoa, speed racer. We got, I feel All like right. we got to get a little more than that. Um, All right. Yeah, I'm just curious. So you said that you were interested in... Uh, in practice ownership before you even got into dental school. Yeah. Uh, do you have, do you have family that are dentists? Uh, what kind of sparked your interest in that side of the profession? Uh, I have no family that are doctors of any kind. Um, oh, nice. That's, that's super cool. Yeah. So I just, I, I felt like, so I've always liked biology. Um, I've always liked fixing stuff. And uh, I mean, where do those two things intersect? Mm-hmm. Dentistry. Exactly. And and I always wanted to, you know, be my own boss, that sort of thing. Definitely, definitely. Um, did you have any um, specific experiences while you're in college that kind of steered you towards dentistry, or what was kind of the the turning point for you? When, when did you decide that dentistry was going to be the career path for you? Uh, I would say, like, so at the end of sophomore year, uh, I had a two point two GPA, and mm-hmm. I was like. Oh man, what am I gonna do? <laughs> and I was like, well, you know, maybe like I realized I could replace some classes, some grades, and I was like, yeah, well, maybe I'll just I'll just try it. I'll see what what happens. And, mm-hmm. um, I I just studied really hard and did really well. Replaced those grades, graduated on time, and um, I took a year off, but um, got into dental school first try. So yeah, nice, man. I feel like that's that's very impressive. I feel like the the comeback was strong there. Yeah, that's pretty much what they said at all the interviews. That's awesome. Well, and I think that like it shows like if you're willing to put your mind towards something, like you can you can do it. And I feel like that's lots of times why dental schools will really look at those last couple of years because they're like, okay, maybe the first couple of years they didn't know what's going on or they didn't know what they wanted to do. But once they really you know focus and put their mind to it, which is what you'd be doing in dental school, then you can really you know, make something great out of it. So that's awesome. Yeah, man. Absolutely. Um, so knowing that you wanted to be a practice owner, how did that uh, change your dental school experience or what did you, what did you do differently as a result and, or like as a result of that thought? So I always would listen to like audiobooks and podcasts when I was driving. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I went to school out of state, so I was driving home all the time. And, uh, I listened to like business audiobooks, uh, this podcast, other podcasts. Um, 
basically anything or like uh, there were a lot of podcasts about like entrepreneurs. So I pretty much anything remotely like that. I just uh, listen to all the time. Oh yeah. That's awesome. It's so funny. Like all, like all the different people in shared practices are just highly motivated people. You can not talk to any of them. You can live on different sides of the continent and continent yes continent that's right um (laughs) but yeah like you you still end up doing the same things and i just think it's really cool to see that you know despite not being plugged into the same you know school the same resources you still kind of are on the same track uh, which is really awesome i feel like steven i feel like you can probably relate to that as well yeah absolutely definitely um awesome man so went through school you were really thinking okay ownership is going to be for me um you graduate, and then I'm assuming you're in an associate position now. Yes. What uh, What's that been like for you so far? Well, so my first job, first off, because of COVID, I I couldn't start until like August after graduating. Mm-hmm. Um, my first job used COVID as an excuse to cut my pay like dramatically. Uh. So as soon as I started there, I was looking for another job. Um, I actually almost bought a practice. I was like, well, maybe I should just buy a practice now instead of hopping between two jobs. So I almost bought a practice um, after a couple of months out, but financing was a little too slow. Mm-hmm. So um, someone else scooped it up before I could. So I ended up getting another job. Um, I was unemployed for a month, which was actually kind of nice because, uh, <laughs> you know, this is the six months of not doing nothing with COVID wasn't enough. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Uh, so yeah, I'm currently an associate at a, it's like a PPO Medicaid mix. It's really weird because it's like that is mostly, mostly PPO okay. with some Medicaid, which is my first job was a hundred percent Medicaid, mm-hmm. but I've, yeah, I don't know how they make it work. Yeah, how have you liked that, that experience? Uh, um, well, the PPO patients are great, and the Medicaid patients, it's like, uh, I could be getting paid like four times what I'm going to get paid to do the same thing. Mm-hmm. So, don't recommend Medicaid unless you really, really like working hard. Yeah, I was actually curious. So, I feel like most people that we get on here work at PPO offices and associate. Um, would you care to just kind of elaborate a little bit on, you know, your, your experience at a Medicaid office? Was there anything good that you got to take away from it as far as, you know, speed or um, sure. dealing with a lot of things on your hands? Like what, what was that like for you? Yeah. So I, I approached it. I, I intentionally wanted to go to a Medicaid office. Um, I knew it would be kind of tough. Um, but I also knew that if I approached it with the right mindset where I'm just developing skills and like not trying to just do as much work as possible and get as much money as possible. Then I could actually get faster at doing good dentistry. Um, and then once I have an office, a PPO, a fee for service office, then I can really crank out good dentistry. Definitely. Yeah. It's, uh, it's definitely a different model, but I mean, there's definitely people that make it work. So if that's, yeah. if that's the patients that you like serving and that's kind of just how you like being I, I mean, I know people that, um, if they had the option to kind of sit around and just be really chill all day or be just skating around from room to room, they genuinely prefer just being really busy. And I feel like for people like that, it's, you know, it's, it's a model that could definitely work for them. Yeah, um, but also props to you for having a long-term vision for knowing that, you know, even if this wasn't your long-term, you know, working in a Medicaid office, being able to say, you know, what, I'm going to go into this with the intention of gaining hand skills and, you know, gaining speed. Um, you know, that, that's, that's an awesome opportunity for you. Thanks. Yeah, exactly. That's a, yeah. Cause a lot of people will just look at that opportunity surface level and be like, I don't want to be running around doing all these things, making, you know, a little amount of money or less than they would, um, somewhere else. But yeah, like you are saying, you, you knew what you wanted long-term and you, you know, thought this is a great stepping stone to get there. So yeah, couldn't agree more with what you said, Steven. Um, awesome. So Medicaid office for a little bit out of school, PPO slash Medicaid mix, which is very odd. Yeah. Uh, would you want to expand a little bit more on that one too? What was that office sure. like? Or I guess, what is it like? So from what the, so I, I've only been there for six months now, I think. Um, 
from what the staff have told me, it used to be more PPO, and then they, it, it's a small DSO, and they, uh, I guess their model, like, I, I'm kind of on the fringe of a city, and on the inner city practices that they own, they, they kind of have like a heavier Medicaid model, but this mm. office, for whatever reason, they bought it in like a nicer area. So it was mostly PPO to start with. And they've kind of been like pushing it towards Medicaid with like, um, they sent out like these flyers that make it seem like a big like discount dental place, um, like advertising crowns for uh, five ninety nine, like oh, really, yeah. really low, yeah, really low yeah. prices. And if you're wondering, uh, Medicaid crown, so five ninety nine sounds low to you. Uh, Medicaid crown is two thirty five. Wow. wow, that's yeah. crazy. Yeah. And I feel like you always hear people saying that, um, like Medicaid fees are on the lower side, but I don't really hear people put numbers to it too often. So yeah, that's that's definitely eye opening for sure. Um, that's so interesting because I feel like the PPO and the Medicaid office experience are very different. And I feel like by trying to bring more Medicaid patients in, you're kind of like changing the feel of how the office runs. Uh, did, did you notice yeah. that or do you notice that in the office? Yeah, it's really like it has the potential to be, if I own the practice, I'd probably be doing things way differently. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I guess that's easy to say, not actually running it. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, it, it's weird because it's like you almost have to like check before you. You're not supposed to, but like you're supposed to. You you almost have to like check before you see each patient and see if they're Medicaid or insurance or um, out of pocket to see like how much time you can spend with them. Yeah, which is yeah, it's it like you don't want it to be like that way, but it's almost kind of how you have to do it. Yeah, yeah, sad uh, but true. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting for sure. Cool. So yeah, it sounds like you've, you know, you had a little bit, I guess you have right around a year of experience under your belt, um, out of school, um, at a couple different offices, which is good. I feel like it's always nice to be able to, you know, see how different people run it. Uh, I feel like lots of times you end up learning, you know, things that you don't want to do. Um, but yeah. I feel like those and can I, be, go for it. I, I should say in between jobs, I also worked, um, a few days at a, they, I, I did like working interviews, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. I did some at a PPO, purely PPO office, um, and uh, another at a fee for service office. The guy actually wanted me to kind of like start up. He, he had bought a new practice and he wanted me to build it up from the ground. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't want to spend a year. Uh, I figured I could either develop all my skills and then buy my own place or. Um, spend a year sitting around doing nothing and then <laughs> be stuck there yeah yeah and it's for people like like you like me like steven it's like very tough to like sit there and build something for someone else um yeah it like if you you know you if you have a piece of ownership like that's a different thing but if it's just strictly an associateship really you know building something that's explosive it's hard to you know kind of be on the sidelines of of all that growth so I don't blame you there. Um, so uh, before we get into the opportunity or opportunities, whatever we want to call it, um, let's just get into a little bit of your, you know, your vision and what you're, what you're looking for out of an office, out of your career. Sure. So ultimately, uh, well, okay. What I want is time and money. Hmm. Um, and I think the best way to do that is through a group practice. So mm -hmm. I've, I've tried to share practices Kool-Aid. Uh, <laughs> We'd love to hear it. Yeah. And um, yeah, I think a group, group practice is at least a great stepping stone. Um, mm -hmm. you, know, you can always get more later on if you want to do the whole multi-office thing. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so I, I want a group practice eventually. Um, and uh, I guess that's maybe a good segue into how this is practice is kind of how, uh, how it's set up. Yeah, yeah. I feel like we we have put it off too long. I feel like we need to we need to dip into it because it's it's an interesting one. At least I think it is. 
So yeah, go ahead and just uh, break it down for us. Give us, you know, kind of surface level overview, and then we'll dip a little bit deeper into, you know, everything that the practice has to offer. Sure. So it's, uh, it's two doctors in one building, which I guess sounds normal so far. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's where the weirdness starts. It's, (laughs) it's, it's, uh, four operatories total. And, um, they kind of have like a staggered schedule. One of the doctors does all of his own hygiene and only works out of one operatory. The other doctor has a hygienist, one hygienist, and works out of three operatories. And okay. that doctor, the doctor with the hygienist and three operatories, um, I guess we can call him Dr. One. He okay. produces more than double what the other doctor, Dr. Two, produces. I feel like that that, yeah. that would make sense given you know his usage of the ops, right? Right. And are these uh, are these two doctors in the same practice or are they practicing separately with two different entities? Yeah, so it's two separate legal business entities. That's okay. interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, so four ops total in the building. Yes. Um, they just practice at different times. And... Not always. I mean, there are some days, I actually have a schedule in front of me. There are some days, oh, nice. um, looks like Tuesday and every other Friday. Oh, and Monday, they're practicing together. So Monday, Tuesday, Friday, they're both there. Yes. Interesting. So I was going to say for the doc that uses like the three ops and one with hygiene, I guess he, does he do that on the days the other guy isn't there? So, okay, sorry. So it's, he does two operatories and the hygienist takes one. But the hygienist is only working for him. Okay. So odd. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. Um, what the, on, yeah, on what the days is, the doc two isn't there, the fourth operator is just sitting there. Okay. Um, what uh, let's uh, let's jump into kind of collections and uh, some more details around that. Sure. So uh, let me pull up the numbers. So uh, doc one. These are twenty eighteen numbers because they're the most complete, but they're all very consistent. Okay. Um, his collections were seven hundred and twelve thousand. Okay. And uh, his profit on the tax returns from that was a little over four hundred thousand. Which is pretty solid. Which, wow. I guess which is that's, that's some ridiculous, good. yeah, ridiculous overhead. Ridiculous. Although I guess well. if you've got a, I guess if you have three operatories and one staff or one hygienist. Yeah. Yeah. yeah what's the uh, What's the rest of the staff like? Um, there's two front office and, um, it's, it's all part-time staff. So it's like kind of hard to keep track of, but I Mm -hmm. believe it's two front office and one assistant. And do they split time or is it just for Dr. One? Oh, Dr. Two does not have an assistant. He does, works he have, alone does he split the time of, with the uh, with the front desk? Like does yes. does he? Yeah. Okay. So it's sixty six percent, thirty three percent. The the lower producing doc takes thirty three percent. Interesting. Or pays pays thirty three percent of their salary. That, so what the heck? This is so weird. So <laughs> you're, telling, you're telling me that one hygienist only works for one doc, yes. and then also has an assistant. The other doc, which is doc two, which you're saying is like a lower producing doc, has no yes. assistant, no hygienist, but uses the front desk. Yes. Like for 33% of the time. Basically. And he does have a hygienist that comes in once a week when doc one isn't there. <laughs> <laughs> what is happening? How did you find this? Yeah. It's bizarre. <laughs> um, well, okay. So I definitely have some thoughts. Uh, but I'm kind of curious what, like, what you've been thinking as you've been going along with this. Like, what what thoughts have you been having? So, both doctors only work like, on average, like 32 hours a week. Um, they every other week is different. So it's like you know every other Friday's off and mm-hmm. um, every third Saturday, like you know one of those weird schedules. But um, 
the cash flow of this place is ridiculous. Um, I don't think I haven't said what Doc Two does. He he produces uh, a little over three hundred thousand and collects um, about one hundred and eighty consistently. Or sorry, um, profits about one hundred and eighty consistently. Okay. And that's that's again from his tax return. So that's not counting um, depreciated things. Yeah. So it's yeah. really really he's taking home a little bit more than that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, yeah, the cash flow is great, and there's there is space for a fifth operatory. So the there's a a break room um, that I could pretty easily turn into a, a fifth operatory, mm-hmm. and then so it's like a first floor. It's it's a ranch. It's a first floor, and then there's a basement. And the basement is the exact same footprint as the first floor. And there's really like so much space. They don't know what to do with it all. They like, they had a squat racket at one point down there. Like what? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, he was like lifting weights in between patients. Um, <laughs> but I can move the, I can move the, um, staff room down there and then make the current staff room into an operatory. This is so interesting. I feel like I like most of the time when someone describes a practice, I can kind of like picture it in my head. I haven't like the hardest time with this. <laughs> oh, and yeah, and to make it even more weird, this used to be a house. It was built in the fifties, and a doctor, a dentist, lived in one half and practiced in the other half. Okay. So like his bedroom was next to an operatory. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's more interesting been, by the minute. <laughs> it's been slowly converted into a full dental practice since then. Wow. That is, huh. yeah, this is definitely probably going to take the cake for the most unique opportunity that I feel like I've <laughs> heard of. Um, so uh, I know you said that you're interested in group practice. Uh, for you personally, how do you see this being your stepping stone? Because uh, I mean, I, I'm seeing a, a lack of ops here. Is there expansion opportunity yeah. or what, what are your thoughts? So the, Building itself is for sale, so there's a few options. Um, I could buy the property and then expand it, which sounds kind of unappealing because then you're expanding this kind of crappy old house, um, putting much money into it. Mm-hmm. And you probably have to shut down while they're building it and you have to deal with all mm-hmm. the city regulations and whatnot. Um, the other option is to just pick it up and move it Mm -hmm. um which i would probably want to wait um you know a year or two really get uh oh the other thing is doc two um he would stay on so that's the lesser producing doc would stay on and um he is not accepting new patients so there's been there's a very low new patient flow like they they don't have hard numbers, but they estimated like ten or less a month total. But that's really? only to Doctor One then. Correct. Okay. Okay. So interesting. Gosh, I feel like everything you say, like I'm like, oh, he's surely he's gonna say this, and then it's just like the exact opposite. <laughs> <laughs> oh my yep. gosh, that's that's so interesting. So you, this would you're you'd be going into this acquisition with the thought of moving it most likely yeah most likely okay yeah because i mean so you said there'd be a total you could add another op so you could maybe get up to five Mm -hmm. but the question is you know if i'm gonna move it is it really even worth spending 40 grand or whatever to have a fifth operatory or should i just keep it at four and then Mm -hmm. yeah Yeah. let's let's see the total collections between the two guys is a little over a million Right, a million, million. Yeah, uh, yeah. So I mean, for four ops, they're definitely kind of maxing out the space. Mm-hmm. I would say, especially because the one doc just works alone in his own operatory. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so yeah. So he's super low overhead. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. So interesting. Yeah, this is um, this is an interesting one for sure. Because it's like the obviously you know. Like you said, the the profit is already pretty good. Um, 
and they're already producing a decent amount and there's really no room to expand. Hmm. Steven, do you have any, have any thoughts here? So I, I find it interesting that you've mentioned that you could add on another operatory, but if the long-term goal is to go into a group practice and you're not sure that five operatories can sustain a group practice, um, I guess what I'm thinking is, have you looked at other area, other, um, you know, commercial real estate availability in the area? Is that an option? Is it something that we're down the road, you might be able to move into another, another place? Yeah, so there's actually, actually interviewed for a job at the, there's a dental office across the street. And um, I okay. interviewed there and it's like, kind of just sitting empty. And because um, the doctor, it, it's like part of a, um, one doctor owns like um, eight practices or something. And the doctor that used to be there, um, I think he died. And then it's just kind of been empty. So maybe okay. that doctor would let me buy it. Um, otherwise, it's in a pretty like it's in like not not quite a urban environment but like suburban urban mix um okay. so there's there's a good amount of um commercial real estate nearby okay yeah because yeah it's to to me like this opportunity doesn't sound like it has a ton of growth on the table i mean clearly mm-hmm. they're you know, they have two docs there, the profit's good. Um, but for someone like you who doesn't want to come in and be doing all the work, uh, I mean, I feel like you're, the profit would definitely take a hit because you'd know you'd, you'd get in some hygienists in there um, just to prepare to be able to grow and kind of yeah. get that upward trajectory towards a group practice. Um, yeah, this is uh, an interesting one for sure. Uh, what I was going to say, what avenues have you um, been using to try to find practices? Did you find this through a broker? Have you done mailers? Uh, what's that process been for you? Yeah, so I've been look, I've been talking to brokers for a while, and um, I started preparing mailers. Um, well, let me back up. I'm looking. I actually like went on Google Maps and like mapped out the area that I want to buy a practice. I thought it was huge, but then when I went on the maps, I realized. Really, I'm looking at like a, like an equilateral triangle with 15 miles on each side. So like, not that big. Uh, okay. So like, I don't know, what is that, like 100 square miles, 150 square miles, something like that. Okay. Um, and it's in like a mostly suburban area. So there's not a ton of practices available in that area. And I, I started making mailers, but... You know, each person, each dentist, I'd like look look them up and look up the practice. And it was always like a a tiny little office. And I was like, I don't know, I guess kind of discouraged me. Gotcha. So you, you kind of feel like you're like probably not going to acquire an office that's that big in the area that you're looking. Right. Yeah. Like they're all, they're all four or five operatories unless you want to go way, way out. Okay. And that's yeah, not like uncommon. The- yeah, the the four to five op practices are there's a lot of them. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, once you start getting to six to eight, that's where you really start seeing less of them. Yeah, uh, and actually, even the practice I work at now, which is a, a group, like there's two doctors there every day. There's mm-hmm. only five operatories. Ah, interesting. Okay. See, so, yeah, I feel like this changes things a little bit because if you if there's not a whole lot of practices around that are that big, and um, you know you've kind of exhausted your different avenues to mm-hmm try to find practices then this this might be one of the better options that you have um either that or doing a startup which i don't know if you're no. have you ever <laughs> <Nope>. <laughs> i i completely share george's opinion about startups i i just don't want to do all the like tedious work of making a system for every single thing buying every single thing figuring everything out like i just want something with patients there that i can tweak okay yeah, and then I feel like I'm a lot warmer to this idea than I was ten minutes ago. Um, yeah, I'm if too. you, yeah, I was gonna say if you if you've already exhausted your avenues as far as finding practices, 
you know what area you want to be in and um you know i mean between the two practices or between yeah two practices right air quotes for people who can't see me on video um <laughs> you're i mean they're doing pretty well they have you know they're doing almost a million in collections or a little bit over um yeah. so yeah also i apologize in advance uh they happen to be delivering a couch at my house right now so uh if we hear any background noise from that i'll try my best to block it out um but yeah man so it, it sounds like you need to put, is, a, put a blanket on the floor like uh Stephen. There, there's a lot of them there's a lot of them around that's for sure um, <laughs> i didn't think that was gonna get brought up but... <laughs> well it, it, when there's echoes you know it just, it's not a good sound yeah. so um we make it work though um great so yeah i mean steven what are your thoughts on you know where we're at with this whole what with our thoughts on this opportunity yeah i mean if you are if you're looking at a more specific area that you're honed in on and you've kind of exhausted all the avenues of finding a practice um i mean i definitely would say it's worth giving it a second look um i, I do think we probably need to dive into a few other numbers though other than just like collections and you know what the doctors are taking home because you know um could be all you know, there, there's yeah it could, it could be something that's <laughs> right so, so let's take a what, tell us about the tell us about more about what's going on inside of inside of these practices sure so the the doctors um they're basically just bread and butter dentists they mm -hmm. um actually they share kind of my same opinions about things like they hate removable, which I hate. <laughs> they hate endo, which I hate. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they hate surgery, which I love. So that would be something okay. I could I could add. They literally didn't do a single extraction um, the last three years. Either of them, I think I think one of them has done like less than ten endos a year. Um, yeah, I noticed on this one sheet that I noticed one has zero percent endo and the other one has one percent endo. So <laughs> yeah, these are yeah. my these are my kind of guys. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, so that's the other thing. Like, it's hard to find an office that's producing a lot with a lot of operatories with my skill set, like just bread and butter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, Stephen, that's a very good point. We that we didn't dive into. Um, so. Pretty much bread butter. Um, that's good. That's definitely a good thing. You said you like surgery. What specifically do you just like extractions? Like, do you like implants? What do you like specifically? So I just do um, simple and surgical extractions. Everything but like third molars, unless they're really easy. Okay. Yeah. So if they're like erupted, you'll like go for it. But if they're yeah. impacted, then yeah, especially upper ones. Upper ones are pretty easy. Lowers are hard. Okay. Yeah. So it, it sounds like these practices are going to be something that'll be good for you to get into. Um, I know you said that uh, they're not doing endo, they're not doing uh, much surgery, really, uh, no implants. So yeah, it sounds like something that'd be good for you to get into. Uh, do you have any long-term goals as far as procedures you'd like to add in the future, or are you kind of content with where you're at right now? Um, well, you know, if my goal is, this is one of those things where if, if my goal long-term is to not be practicing that much, then it's like hard to justify spending a bunch of money on uh, like implant classes or, you know, those sort of specialty classes. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely see where you're coming from there. Yeah. Um, so like I could, I could do some like anterior endo, like I've done that a few times and it's, it's not bad, but beyond mm -hmm. that, I have little interest in it. That's fair. Yeah. I, I definitely see, I definitely see where you're coming from with that. Um, so uh it sounds like from a lot of different standpoints these probably will be uh good practices for you to buy so uh let's say you know let's say we're just planning on moving forward with it uh have you thought about what would be your steps um you know once you get into the practice what you do moving forward and just kind of the process uh there sure so uh, like i said we there's a few paths you can go down with this um i think if, if i want to be at this location a little bit longer term, I could build that operatory. Um, I actually had a contractor walk through this office, and he said, "If you want to get rid of the patient waiting area, 
which is currently useless. Um, you could have six operatories in it. Or if you want a smaller waiting area, you can knock down a wall and shift things over. So you, you could have six operatories in it, but it'd be kind of cramped. Um, but I, I still think the better option would probably be, you know, the, the oh, I should say Dr. Two, the lesser producer wants to stay for probably about a year, maybe 18 months. So um, he, after he leaves, I'll have a, another operatory to fill and I could put a second hygienist in there. Um, if I even am going to be there in 18 months, but um, you know, once new patient flow ramps up, um, add another hygienist, and um, once I'm kind of like really, really pushing the limits, then jump locations. Yeah, ideally, yeah, yeah ideally, it is something much larger, like twice the size, like ten ops. Yes. Anything in the double digits has my, has my seal of approval. Um, but yeah, that, that sounds good. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's not, it's not ideal, uh, for the second doctor wanting to stay on, but, uh, for a year's time, I think that's something you could definitely, you know, deal with for the time being. Uh, I can tell you that you're probably going to wish he was gone much sooner. Um, but <laughs> the good if, thing though is his, uh, because his overhead is ridiculously low mm-hmm. and he, he's said he'll, um, he'll be fine with like, 30% of collections or 35%. Oh. So like oh, wow. his, what I get from him, yeah, will pay for almost like the practice loan. Yeah, that's like, great. That's yeah, nice. So that's like 90K or something. Like that helps a lot. Yeah, because I, I feel like lots of times when doctors stay on, they're like, okay, I want 40, yeah. 45, uh, which like it's kind of hard to say no because they've worked there for so long and you know they've they've done all this time. Um, so yeah, the, the fact that he already threw out that he's cool with thirty percent, and he's thrown out a time frame of how long he wants to be there. Um, like I said, yeah. not ideal, but for what it is, it it definitely would work for your uh, for your situation. Um, so <laughs> I'm assuming you don't plan on running this as, or what would you do as far as um, the doctor situation? Would you plan on being there, you know, four to five days a week um, with him there? Like, would you? bring him down to just a couple days a week. Have you thought all about that? Uh, I would definitely keep things the same for at least the near term future. Um, I think, you know, he's so like space efficient. It'd be hard to say he can't be there when I'm there Mm because I could have um, on the days he's not there, I could have another hygienist and, and then, you know, by the time I'm, really like pushing the limits with that he'll be gone yeah um you know maybe i could make maybe he'd leave after 12 months or i could just talk to him and like, see hey, if man, he's going to leave don't hey. you just want to go enjoy <laughs> retirement like you, you really seem like you're, just, you're you're really itching for it see that golf course over there yeah it's calling your name <laughs> <laughs> exactly yeah, I, exactly yeah he's not hard set on uh on 12 months or 18 months you just you said uh yeah i kind of like to so i think there's options there and flexibility definitely um great so uh kind of one last thing here before we wrap up um how do you feel like your you know experiences leading up to and uh kind of before now have prepared you for practice ownership like if you had any any leadership roles or anywhere or how do you think your role as stepping into a leader in the new practice is going to be compared to, you know, your experiences you've had so far? Oh, uh, well, it's going to be terrifying for sure. I, uh, um, I mean, I think pretty much everyone I've talked to says like that first meeting you have with the staff where your, the doctor is like, all right, see ya. This, this is your new boss. Like that's mm-hmm. like the scariest day of your life. So, you know, I've just kind of accepted that it's going to be tough. Um, I've had a few like small leadership roles. Like, I was an RA in college. Um, hey, so was I. Oh, nice. nice. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. And then just like, even now, like I try to, in my current job, um, since the owner is not there because he's 
just like some DSO, other, he's not even a dentist. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I try to like be involved as much as I can. Um, so that, that's like as prepared as you can do realistically be, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like just kind of having that awareness, like knowing that, yes, like there's a leadership role that I'm going to have to step into. Like, even if it is challenging at first, like the fact that you're aware of it and you know, like this is what you're getting into. This is kind of the, I don't want to say price you have to pay, but uh, it, and it's something you have to get over. And, you know, as you're in the practice more, it just comes easier and easier. Yep. Um, it's like public speaking or something. Like you just have to do it. Yeah. There's no, you can't like half do it. Yeah, it's like it's like dentistry too like yeah the first yeah. time you pull a tooth you're like kind of scared you're like am i hurting them like what what am i doing with this like instrument but yeah by the time you've done 100 200 300 like it just kind of becomes second nature and i feel like yep. um, leadership is no different um well and you've been awesome. preparing well, for it for a while you mentioned that you were listening to podcasts you know throughout dental school when you were out of, and throughout undergrad when you were out of state and everything so i mean this mm -hmm. has been a long time coming i feel like you're more prepared than you probably think you are yeah, hopefully. I hope you're right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very good point, Stephen. Uh, I feel like a lot of us um, think about all the things we don't know, but in reality, you know, there's a lot of things we do know that we're just kind of putting on the back burner because that's just what we do. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, awesome. I, I really feel like I know I wasn't very warm on the opportunity initially just with the four ops, with the two docs and the really funky like scheduling and staff. Um, but Given that you've tried all your options, you're in a relatively small search radius. Uh, yeah, I really feel like this could be a good option for you. Yeah, uh, and I think the like the crazy cash flow. Um, you know, it's it's like doing over five hundred thousand cash flow, so yeah. that gives you a lot of flexibility to to like move, and that's what all the bankers are telling you to like, save up, move. Yeah, <laughs> bankers telling you to move. And I feel like that's when you know. Yeah, right. Because I feel like normally they don't care. They're just like, as long as there's cash flow, like you're good. Yep. Um. Yeah, that's awesome, Stephen. Do you have any any closing thoughts here before we wrap it up? I don't. Awesome. Well, um, Darth Vader, it has been fantastic uh, learning more about your opportunities here. Um, definitely looking forward to hearing. You know, if you do decide to go through with them. And if you do, uh, we'd love to have you back on the show. It's kind of cool to get um, people on the opposite side of ownership kind of hearing before, you know, what they're thinking about the practices or practice they're buying and then after as well. Um, so, yeah, we really appreciate you having, on, having you on today. Sure. Yeah, this could be the first time you have uh, someone come back on with two practices, technically. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you might have to keep them separate just for that reason. Specifically. Just for that reason. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Well, uh, yeah, once again, thank you so much for being on here. Uh, Steven, okay. it was great being a co-host with you today. And uh, we'll see you guys next week on the Pursuit of Ownership.